Hi there, thanks for listening to Common Sense Medicine. What you're listening to are highlights from my interview with Dr. Jason Ryan. He's the creator of Boards and Beyond. Thousands of students from across the globe use his questions as well as online videos to help study for the Step 1 exam. We went over many things in the podcast, including his background, his opinion on Step 1, as well as his current and future goals for Boards and Beyond. If you're interested in learning about the whole episode as well as the whole interview, the timestamps as well as the whole recording is located on commonsensemd.com. The link is in the description below. Hope you enjoy the interview and as always, if you have any questions or concerns, be sure to leave a comment down below. So it's funny, I was just hearing your voice on the cardiology <laughs> module of Boards and Beyond because that's what block we are in currently. So right. I was looking, listening to those um, those videos and kind of right. hearing your voice right now. It's just like yeah. I was expecting you to say, hello, welcome to the module right. on <laughs> Common Sense. You're probably listening to me at 2x speed or something <laughs> or, or something like that. But yeah, it's good to hear me at 1x, I hope. I think that's a great way to kind of start the conversation with in Common Sense Medicine. So I, I like to ask the guest first and foremost about their background. And obviously, a lot of students around the globe know you as the Boards and Beyond guy. But how did it come to that? What what brought you to medicine, first of all? And then how did you get the idea that your input in boards education was needed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, my, my dad's a chemist, and he, he talked about chemistry stuff when I was growing up. So I, I went to college and was a chemical engineer, like you mentioned in my bio. And I had a job after graduation, but I really didn't like it that much. And so I started reconsidering my options. And in a lot of my classes in college, there had been medical students, and I always thought they were sort of nuts to want to train for so long for their job. But after I saw what the real world was like, I sort of thought maybe it's worth training for so long if it gets you to a place that you're really happy being. Uh, so I reconsidered and went back to medical school and ultimately settled in cardiology. And the Boards and Beyond story really starts when I finished fellowship in cardiology in 2008. I started working at University of Connecticut, which is where I had also gone to medical school. And I taught some classes and, and the students liked my lectures. And at the time, our lectures were video recorded. And some of the students told me they watched my videos over and over, my video lectures over and over. And so that kind of planted the idea in my head. And then around this time, Pathoma had just come out. And so I was seeing YouTube and Pathoma. And so I sort of got the idea to start making these videos. I never knew it would get to where it is today. In the beginning, I just thought I'll make some cardiology videos and see how it goes, but it grew in popularity and here we are. Yeah, um, well, it may not seem this way, but step one has always been really important. Even when I was in medical school in the late 1990s, step one was a big deal. There were students in my class and the class ahead of me and before me who would skip lectures just to study from board review books. I think what's changed is there's so many resources now, um, which in a way is good. There were subjects that were just so hard for me to learn. There was just no good resource on it, except for maybe a dense textbook. And that was all I had. And we had very few practice questions. So I went into step one, really not having practice. There were no MBMEs. There was no UWorld type thing. So I really went in, you know, having just read a lot and having to use that to try and answer questions for the first time. Now with all these resources, it, I feel like you guys are smarter than I ever was at your stage. You know so much more. You understand it so well. Unfortunately, that's had the effect of raising the average score. So now there's more and more pressure to make sure you get through all these resources and you get that average score or that above average score. And it's really in a it has gotten to a for, sort of fever pitch where step one is kind of consuming everything. Um, I think there has to be something that is measured in all medical students that can be used to compare them for residency because residencies are competitive. So we need some standardized assessment. So I don't know that you'll ever have a world where there is nothing like step one, no test that you ever have to take to sort of evaluate you as a screening purpose. I think step one could be improved a lot. You know, I wish there were a little bit less of the biochemistry, Krebs cycle sort of things and a little bit more on things we actually do in medicine, like clinical trials and image interpretation and things like that. But unfortunately, where it is right now, you guys are spending a lot of time mastering material that isn't that relevant to day-to-day -day clinical practice. And that's just the nature of step one right now. Yeah. You know. 
I mean, if you made step one pass fail, definitely it would take some of the pressure off to score highly on step one. But residency program directors need something to screen, so they would quickly find something else to screen you by. I don't know what that would be. Um, you know, it might be the school that you come from. They might even ask for your MCAT score and use that. But, you know, when you're a dermatology program with three spots and you have 500 applications, you can't read through all those applications to look at all the letters of rec. You need something to boil them down to 50 or 100 that you can actually read through. So my, I, I don't really have a problem if they wanted to make step one pass fail, but I don't think they should do it till they decide what would replace it. And nobody's been able to create a clear vision of what that would be. Some people say, could it be step two? Um, the problem with that is you don't, you, most students don't take step two till the beginning of their fourth year, which means that you would, you would not know where you stand in terms of competitiveness for residencies through your entire first three years of schooling. And that would make it really hard for you to sort of evaluate your odds of getting into certain specialties and making career choices. So the timing of step one at the end of the second year, I think, is a good place to have some sort of standardized test. Um, but uh, uh, right now, the test, it just, in my view, the problem with the test is it just has so much sort of minutia that really isn't relevant to clinical practice. And, you know, you, you students come up to me and ask me these detailed questions about DNA changes in some mold disease. It's nothing I ever think about as a clinician. I have to look it up to even understand it myself. And I, I sort of wish you didn't have to do so much of that. And instead, you were spending your time, you know, memorizing the five trials on heart failure that have come out in the last year that had results that impact clinical practice or something along those lines. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The harsh reality is that medical schools are a business and they have a balance sheet and budgets. And so for a faculty member like me or someone with a PhD, you can basically do three things that benefit the institution. One is to obtain research grants, one is to see patients, um, and the other is to teach. And of those three things, the, the least revenue generating is teaching. You know, uh, my, they, would much, this, they would get more value out of me as a faculty member if I just saw patients all day and never taught a medical student. They would get more value out of a PhD if they got research grants all day and applied for more grants rather than teaching. So what inevitably ends up happening is that faculty members who are good at research end up getting pushed to just do more research. And faculty members who are really good at seeing patients end up seeing more patients. And so the people that end up teaching are all either people like me who really like it and just want to do it and make, make an emphasis on it, or people who, for whatever reason, aren't uh, able to do those other things. But people definitely aren't hired for their teaching skills. You know, they're hired for their ability to get grants or see patients, unfortunately. And that's what you guys see. I hear it in your frustration. You know. Why is this person giving a lecture? And then I, I look and I say, well, this person was hired because they're able to bring in millions of dollars of grants and they're asked to teach as part of their job, but that's not the primary reason they were hired. So we don't hire people for their teaching skills most of the time, unfortunately. And that's why you end up getting a mix. You get some people who you may really like and other people who you may not. Yeah, we're working on step two, three videos now. Uh, this was something I had never planned to do, but we got a lot of requests and people like the step one format so much. And I think it kind of makes sense if you learn the way I think about, you know, nephrotic syndrome for step one, and you, I can show it to you again in a more clinical format for step two, and it will kind of work. So I think over the next few years, we'll work on, on getting step two videos and questions. And the goal would be for any topic you want to learn in your first four years, you can find a video and some practice questions on it. And that can be your foundation. Um, you know, I've never tried to make Boards and Beyond something that can replace textbooks and, and, and things like that, but it will give you, you know, the broad overview and let you understand the disease and then you can go learn about it however you want. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say you just have to stay humble. You know, you're not you're not going to be a king in medicine. It's a team project. It's a team effort. Um, and if you're sort of going into it thinking, OK, now I'm a student, but eventually I'm going to be the attending and I'll get to call the shots and I'll get to do whatever I want. You will end up very unhappy. Um, a lot of patients you can't help very much. They have chronic illnesses. Maybe they're very elderly. There's not a lot we can do for it. So you'll be humbled again and again by disease in the human body. So you have to be prepared for that. You know, if you're going into this for the glory, it will be disappointing. If you're going in this 
for the satisfaction of really getting to know people, uh, going on a journey with them uh, and becoming part of their lives, you'll have a great career. And I think that's really the most important thing is to put yourself in context of, of the fact that you're not going to be able to do every single thing you want, but you can still have a great career. It seems-